Okay, gotta switch the music up here. Oh no. Get the fancy stuff going here. Maybe we'll do Sonic tonight. Okay. Hello, everybody. Let me make sure my audio is good. I feel like something's not quite right. Let me see. No, it should be fine. Okay. All right. Well, gonna do some more uh, Shiny Developing here on another Shiny Developer Series live stream. My name is Eric, and um, got a lot of things happening this uh, in, in about a month. <laughs> April's gonna be quite busy, but looking forward to doing some cool stuff and I'm gonna do maybe a little research into the workshop I'm about to teach in a few months and you know maybe a another kind of major feature I want to start with the shiny brain package that we've been working on for seems like over three or four months now so let's get to it I still feel like there's something off here but I just don't know what it is but we'll roll with it <laughs> Let's see, let's get to our source here. Okay, we don't need to see the uh, OBS stuff. I was doing some tweaking earlier tonight, so we'll close that up. We'll bring Shiny Brain up again. VS Code. Hopefully nothing crazy here. Sizing of this looks a little. Is that the right size? It should be. Something. No, I don't want. I don't need good cracking up there today. Move that out. All right. Okay. I think we're ready to go and let me figure out which thing to tackle first. I think I will tackle the uh, shiny brain stuff while well, it's fresh in my mind. Kind of the feature I want to implement here. Let's put dark mode on right now. Okay. And the feature I want to put in my um, templates of shiny brain apps is going to be search for it here the display mode so if, if you're familiar with shiny already this will be review but if you haven't seen shiny before it is um, a package in R to do web applications um, using R code or customizing it with all the web development techniques that, that you know you can throw them in here versus CSS or JavaScript extensions. But when you run an app by default, you just get the default app view with whatever the user or the developer is letting you see. But there's another mode for executing apps, and that is called showcase mode. Now, what exactly is showcase mode and why do I feel like there's something crazy about my OBS setup here? Um, one of those people when I see something off, I need to, uh, I need to fix it. So I'm about to look into that right now. I can... No, that's not it, is it? Let's see here. That's not the one. Oh, it's in a different thing, isn't it? That's all right. We'll figure it out later. But, um, oh, hello, Tan. Welcome. Hope you're doing well tonight. Um, thanks for, thanks for checking out the latest Art Weekly Highlights episode. That was a lot of fun. And, um, <laughs> what you as the, the listener did not know is that 
little old me had a recording snafu the first time we did it. So actually, Mike and I, that was our second literal episode in that day because we lost the first record that they never recorded. So then I had to I quickly realize that about three quarters of the way through the episode, something wasn't quite right in my um, recording uh, software that we use called Zencaster. And I was a dunce and didn't check it out. <laughs> um, so then I was like, oh, uh oh, Mike, we got a problem here. And then we were like, okay, well, we recorded this many episodes about it happening. And it's like, it's bound to happen. So note to self do not use Microsoft Edge with podcasting recording. I went to Brave and everything was fine after that. So, so yeah, we had, we had good fun with that. So it was, it was, Epic fails all around, um, but it was good to be back, getting the swing of things after a few months uh, layoff. So, yeah, it was a good good episode, I think. And um, hello, West Pacita Buddha, how are you? Um, great to have you here. So, what I want to do for Shiny Brain is to let the user view the code of that particular snapshot of the app within the app itself, because I. If you're gonna show the story of how an app progresses from like prototype to a polished end of it, it's not just, in my opinion, good enough to see what the app looks like, but you might wanna quickly pull up the code with it too and kind of see what different parts are, are doing here. Now, I have done some investigation on this and it doesn't quite work out of the box. So I think I'm gonna to have to do some uh, Customizations here. That's that's where it gets fun, right? So I'll show what happens with it, and then start diving into probably some uh, internals of Shiny itself about that feature, and, and see where that takes us. So let me see. Do I have anything crazy in changes? Nope. That's uh, fire up Shiny Source. That's been the one that's my uh, hello world for this app. So let's uh, kick off R here. And then let's load our package. So I might bump the size up just a little bit. There we go. And we will uh, use my uh, fun Function names of brain power here to run the shiny source app. Okay, I think this is as expected. Yep, everything is here. Page two. Take a little while to load for some reason. A little concerned about that, but nope, everything is everything is here, all in working order. Okay, so. What I want to have is that depending on which snapshot they're looking at in the nav bar here, no matter if it's home or all the way to the last snapshot name, that there would be another button here somewhere. Maybe like view code or something like that, just whatever. And when I hit that, it would kind of put it in the, quickly show the code next to it or something like that. Now what's interesting with the uh, default feature for um, showcase mode in Shiny is you have to enable it when you run the app. And there's a couple ways to do that. You can do it in the run app function or you can have like a kind of like a configuration file. I think it's in like the Debian control format. Yeah, so, or the description file. Yeah, of course. You have a description file and then it will, you can tell it to do showcase mode. That's another way of doing it. I don't really want to do it that way. I want it to be something where the user can kind of turn it on and off. Um, so I hope I can leverage some of this, but I want to invoke it in a different way, a little more dynamically, if you will. Now I will, just to refresh my memory too, it's been a few days, I want to show what happens when I try to do this in a shiny or shiny brain powered app. 
where I think I had done a modification here somewhere. Okay, I think I took it out. I may have had a branch that did it, but my what I was trying to do is I was going to add an additional parameter to the brain power function to tell it to run in showcase mode. In fact, we can just hard code it ourselves. So let's, let's make sure we have the right syntax here. Yep, display mode we can showcase. So we're just gonna temporarily modify this, but let's first uh, do a new branch for it because we never wanna make the main branch uh, crazy here. Call this showcase. There we go. And we'll try this mode equal showcase. Like I said, this is definitely not going to work. I want to see what the error was. Just to refresh our memory here. Well, okay, okay, well, when you run it at this level, it works, in a sense, but this is, this is not what I want the user to see, so we got some work to do. First, uh, hello, David J. Jackson, great to have you here. Um, hope you're doing well in your adventures with... Last time I saw you stream, I know you're still working on databases and learning some of that, so I uh, hope you're doing well there. Now, this... This is, like I said, this app.r, this is not what I want people to see. I want them to see what's making these, this home, page one, page two, page three, etc. apps. So that's technically no errors, but it's just not the right one. So I'm going to stop that for a second. So we know that it can't really be here. We're going to take that out. Now, time to refresh my memory a bit about how brochure handles like running these sub apps, because that is an important thing to figure out as well. So we'll open up the app that are here. Brochure app. And I highly doubt... Well, okay, so... Brochure app's not gonna have any argument about this, but let me just refresh on that right here. Let's see what these arguments are about. We have the on start. Function that will be called before the app is actually run. Yeah, we don't really want that. Let's see what options are. Oh, hey, now. Oh, this is something. I wonder if this will solve it right now. If we do an options with um, a list. Okay, I'm... I'm intrigued. Let's see what happens when we try this. So we should be able to do options equal list. Oh, equal showcase. Boy, if this actually does it. Boy, my life just got a lot easier. Let's see. Oh, what did I? Extra parentheses. Yep. Okay. This will be a hoot if this works. Oh, I'm doing um, do that call. Maybe I have to be more careful about this. What args? 
a list of arguments. So, oh, because I did it in page list is like the argument. So I have to, I have to append that to page list. Okay. Well, again, we're just gonna have fun with this. I think I can just do page list, and I can say options equal list. I think this will work. We will see. Hello, Azug34. Welcome to the stream. If you've been here before, um, yeah, welcome back. If not, thanks for coming over tonight, doing some shiny hacking with my custom package that knock on all the wood in the world that I can talk about later this year at Arsigo Comp, and we will see. Okay, this did not quite work the way I had in mind, but let's see it in full. It's full glory here. But, um... Yeah, you can see... It's just showing the um, the main app.r file every time, so it's definitely not not going to work this way. Um, but it was a it was a good attempt, though. The easy mode did not work. So. Had a feeling that was coming. Um, I may not be able to do this the way that it's done in Basic Shiny. I'm guessing not. Um, but if I can figure out how to do it in each individual app, that's probably the key. So let's look at our app files in here. And just refresh our memory on this too. Function for the UI, that's straightforward. Function for the server. This is for just running the app like the individual snapshot on its own. And then we have a theme function. So not really an easy place to put here. I think it's time we go into the internals of Shiny for this one. Let's see how the showcase mode is, is used in practice. So let's... Uh, Go to the GitHub repo. Let's do a search for showcase. What? Or do display mode. Maybe that'll turn it up. Yeah, okay. So let's see where that is actually coded up. Okay, it might be here. I think there's another file that really has it, but let's just start with this for now. That's the only reference of it. Maybe I'll just do showcase itself. Maybe that'll turn it up. There we are. Yep, okay. We got a combination of CSS and, gosh, even TypeScript? Oh my goodness, wow. Um, that's gonna be gnarly. Uh, <laughs> this may uh, maybe bite more off than I can chew, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah, the showcase.r, I think, is what actually drives all of this, so let's see what they do here. Give the name of a license. Oh, okay. That's when they show the metadata about the app, which I don't care about, so I'm not going to really care about license stuff here. Showcase head. Looks like it's de declaring all the JavaScript and HTML dependencies, so... Okay, they do have a JavaScript file and a CSS file for showcase mode. 
I don't know what showdown is. They let you render a markdown file as well, which I'm not going to do here. Okay, they have metadata. Yeah, I don't care about that. Let's nav tab bars helper. Oh, nav tab. Oh, I know what this is. This is when you do, um, you can toggle between the different file names in the, in the panel that the source code is on. So I think that's just helping populate those with a specific class. And depending on the name itself, they'll make that one active if it's an app.r or a server.r. Otherwise, it won't be given an uh, attribute of active. Then it's doing a link to the file with an underscore code. That's interesting. I don't know what this nav top drop down stuff is doing. Um, tab content. This, okay, this is something I wanna, okay. This, this is the meat of it right here. So it's really just reading the contents of the script that comprise your app. And then I think it's just gonna write that in HTML and format it as like the code uh, tag. And then paste each line, collapse it with a new line character, don't indent it. So it's literally just syncing the file. So I should be able to do something similar if I know what the file is. The key is getting the, the file returned dynamically. Okay. Showcase code tabs. This looks like a wrapper to certain things. I'm gonna list all the files of a .r or a capital R extension, that's good. If there is a global file or a www folder, it's going to find all the... Okay, so it's finding all the JavaScript, CSS, and straight HTML. It's going to create a div, links, class, on click. Okay. And then the tab content. Okay, now they're calling the utility functions they set up. Tab content helper for the R files, for any web files, and then the license thing. So that's getting the showcase tabs. This is the app info, which I don't really care as much, I don't think. Uh... Yeah, the README and the license. Yeah, we don't care about that. Okay, the body of it. The body of the showcase document. Default for showcase mode. Well, okay, that's a lot. That's a lot to process, but I think I have to take this one, one bit at a time. The real meat of this is getting the file contents which was um yeah this right here given a path of files to grab them yeah you can see it's um where's tab content helper yeah it's what put right here yep so it's given a different class so they got the tab view and bootstrap, and then each tab's got the file names. And hello, Unicorn Coder. Yeah, no, no worries at all. I did get started a little earlier, but that's because I wanted to do some more research while it's fresh in my mind, and plus when I still have energy. It's been a, it's been a long week already. So okay, so maybe the first thing I attempt is reading the file in the app 
at some point. So, okay, let's strategize this. Um, I don't want the user to have to enter this manually, so I'm going to have to put this somewhere where it's as least friction as possible for it to be rendered. And usually what I do is in the app.r, this is where I create the navigation bar for them, this gen nav items uh, function. We could do something kind of like that with the app code and just have it rendered because we're already grabbing for stuff already so maybe the first step is to um for each page id grab all the r code for it maybe write a new function to do it why not Call this gen nav bar, maybe gen or or read. I don't know what to call it, but we'll make a new file. All right. Not gen, it's not generating new code. What's a good phrase for this? Um, read app code. I don't know. We'll change the name later. Save this. gen nav bar up here because I'm going to use a similar pattern as that. Yeah, gen nav items. Yep. Yeah. Reach. Oh, active tab. Yeah, okay, that's what that's doing. So I'm gonna make just call this uh, page ID. We are gonna need that. Ideally, this should be pretty simple. We want to first list the files that have the correct extension and I do use the um, FS DurLS for this but I'm going to change change it up a little bit Snapshot, or not snapshot, the showcase mode code. I saw some, uh, yeah, we're gonna, whoop, uh-oh, all right, we're on keyboard, okay. Um, we're gonna put this in here. I wanna see how they do this in the FS uh, package way. So I think when they, It's either regex or glob. Which one do I do for this? Let's see. A wildcard globbing pattern. 
I think that's just like that. But then regular expression, this this sure looks like a regular expression to me. So I'm gonna guess that we do um, regex. R, capital R, our sign. Now this will be in a directory page. Yeah, in fact, we better add page ID. Okay, we'll um, debug this first. Kind of hard coded a little bit. Yep, it's the um, good call, unicorn coder. You are spot on. Whenever you see an R, these um, these two slot the what is it the forward slash or the backslash? I always get the direction mixed up, but. Whenever you see these, that is a very pretty clear indicator. We're about to do the um, the regex fun, and the dollar sign is an anchor for like it's ending in this. The caret they use for like exponents is the beginning character. Again, you're not talking to a major uh, <laughs> regex expert here. I just know enough to be dangerous. Um, so let's give this a shot, just hard coding this. Um, so this will be it shiny saurus and then the page B one. Well hey, look at that. I might have it. Well let's see about page two. Oh look at that, look at that. I I think we got it, yeah. Because page two had two of these, the utils and the page two file. Let's see about page three. Yep, utils page three, and this should be the same thing, but with page, yep. <laughs> All right, it worked the first time. That's a that's a shocker for me. Um, now we have the files. Now we gotta grab the contents of it. Now, I will warn all of you, I'm supposed to have thunderstorms in the area tonight, so if I end this early, it may not be because of my choice. <laughs> we'll see. I already saw, I've got a flashes of, uh, you know, my power, like a UPS device at my feet. Just give a little noise there, so we'll see. Oh, I gotta, I gotta put the spotlight on this. The, Dr. Daniel, welcome, by the way, saying that I mentioned that all my employers <laughs> employers know about my other employer. Everything is working out. You're just working all the time. Yeah, you don't get the rest at all. You, you knew what you were getting into. <laughs> but seriously, I hope you're not gonna overtax yourself too much, but I can only imagine trying to pull off what you're pulling off. But uh, yeah, more. Kudos to you for going this far. So, okay. So we got got our R files here. Now we're gonna read them, which should be pretty straightforward. I've always want. Okay, what is this read UTF eight? Um, Who's ready for story oh. time with R? <laughs> Oh boy, oh boy, there we go, huh? Story time. Um, what's the good story? Well, you know what? I will, it, it's, a, it's a productive one. Because, as I'm, some of you are aware that's, that we're, who are watching now, but for those that aren't, um, we do have a pretty uh, major conference coming up, our Studio Conf 2022, and, oh, sorry, dark mode, come back, come back. And we got, uh, let's see, we're, 
Where's the main site? Oh, this is the blog post. But anyway, I'm helping with a workshop and I've been very nervous about it. So I decided to uh, phone somebody that, um, well, so to speak, that has done a great job of workshops in the past. Um, Garrick Aiden Bowie, who's uh, at our studio working on the education stuff and um, and all that. So he had taught this excellent workshop in 2020, the last one that was in person, um, called JavaScript for Shiny Users. And I loved it, even though I could not fully grasp all the material in those two days, I grabbed enough that really got me um, really inspired and taught me a lot. But I thought he really did it very well. And so I thought, okay, well, if I'm going into this for the first time in over 10 years of doing one of these, um, I gotta, I gotta talk, get some advice, get feel like I can actually attain this. And he, he enjoyed talking about this. Like I was afraid it was gonna be one of those things where somebody's like, "Oh yeah, this, this, uh, this uh, dude here, Eric, is gonna keep asking about you know something I did two years ago." No, he was very, very welcoming about it. Um, he was talking about it. He says he actually doesn't get to talk enough about it. So I was like, okay, I'm glad I could oblige. But um, the advice he gave me was really, really helpful. It's one, it's kind of one of those rare times where I can just kind of sit back and soak it all in. And I was frantically typing notes on like the points that he was kind of emphasizing. And there are a few of them that I'll mention here. Um, one is, Never, ever, ever go too long in your sessions. In other words, especially if there's like a break coming up, especially break with food, don't get in the way of your <laughs> students getting to their break because they will remember those things. And I remember he did a good job about that. But I was like, the first point is like, never, ever bleed into the, um, what in the world is that about? Um, bleed into their break time. That was very big advice there. Um, the the second one is that I really should strive for continuity between the different sections. And since this is about building production quality apps, what I want to do, and he definitely recommended this, is build a, like the same overall application throughout the entire workshop. Don't like do these one-off examples, say for shiny modules versus like, you know, deployments or package management or whatever else. Like build this con continuous story so that it feels like the students feel like that they're really enhancing this and getting a more accurate picture of what all these principles fit together as because um, I know from other workshops they will like do these weird examples one off in certain places and it was like I, I kind of lost the overall vision of it so I need to find an app or build one I guess beforehand that I can pick apart and use different pieces of it but in the overall brand app, if you will, of these different concepts. So that may be one of the first things I tackle in the prep work for this is figuring out what app either I've already done or one that I can enhance further down the road um, to encompass all of these ideas. Um, he also um, was quite candid about that he had enough material in his workshop or almost it was like two workshops like total but he selectively removed certain pieces kind of right before the workshop began or before the second day he took out certain things and but he he says if he could do it over again he would not have been that ambitious he really worked very hard on that so for me I have like five core ideas right now and I might add a couple more, but I'm not going to go too overboard with it. I don't want to overwhelm the students with all these different things hitting them at once. Um, I want to tell like a cohesive story with it. So don't be too ambitious, he said. 
And I want to make sure, and this is, again, good advice from him, is that we split up the time between, you know, me or one of the TAs, like, talking about something and then making sure they have hands-on time to do it. I don't want this to be like Eric blabbing for two days straight without them really getting their hands on it. We want them to practice it, and we want to make sure we have ample time to discuss the main points. So it's really breaking it down into like these different components of the, of the workshop, each of them having like one or two like really if you don't remember anything else, remember these two points, kind of set up for it. And then if you have more time in the session, you can talk about some of the other kind of add-ons to it and really build upon it. But there's going to be a lot of material thrown at them. Make sure they don't have to really try to remember so much at once. Um, I think that is, and it all makes sense when I hear it, but when I hear somebody that I respect so much, tell it to me kind of very direct about this and based on his experience I, I definitely was listening so very inspiring like I said it's kind of rare that I get just kind of like sit back and feel like I'm I'm getting the best practical lessons and tips from almost anybody in the community um, it's a nice change of pace let's put it that way so I feel less imposter syndrome now, but now the work kind of begins. I gotta really put this into, um, put this into practice. Um, yeah, Daniel's got some good points. Um, I'm gonna highlight the last one here. Yeah, spending time to do exercises. Yep, that's spot on. You roughly plan three times the amount of time it would take you to do the exercise. Yes, absolutely. That's where Again, I've mentioned this in previous streams, but I will take you all up on this that want to be kind of um, reviewing things as I develop them probably here on stream. I'll develop some stuff. Would love to get your feedback here or on the Discord channel of things that I start to build out there. I can't really open source everything right away because a lot of this is going to be me iterating through probably a bunch of kind of trial by error things, but the things that I feel like I nailed down, I definitely want to run some of that by all of you. So I will definitely take you up on that. And the important thing from your point, Daniel, is I am not the student here. I can't expect the other students to know the ins and outs of working with modules like I do. I got to make sure that what I give them as activities is something reasonable for them to understand and be able to accomplish in the time that I give them. So, so definitely one of the more productive kind of like feeling like I'm talking to a Jedi master kind of session. So Garrick, I don't know if you ever watch any of these, but if you do, thank you. You really made my week because it, it, this is, this is a big deal to me and I want to make sure I do a good job and emulate from the, um, successful peers that I've been watching very, very closely um, over the years, so. And then ironically today, on a separate note, I was able to talk to Joe Chang about some shiny stuff, and I finally showed him one of my, my I'll call the the really, really, really big app that I've been doing at work, and he liked it. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I've impressed the the, 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 the originator of Shiny with something I did. That was, that was fun. Um, they're, they're getting some feedback from some of us in the industry about ways we're using it. So I was kind of showing them what my design pattern was and they're gonna maybe see about enhancing Shiny with some of those ideas. I don't know, we'll see. But they got some plans, early stages, but they got some plans. So two in one week, uh, two great conversations with friends from our studio, that was that was a good time so and then it was back to uh the the grind of uh debugging more uh api call nonsense with another app i'm working on now so <laughs> always always a shift when you go through that so okay so that's that's the me learning stuff uh on a story for sure it's uh Okay, I was looking for this read UTF-8 function. I think that's an internal function, but we'll find out. 
Not quite sure. I've seen this thrown around. Else, yeah. This is not the first package that our city was made that does this. They'll like have their own wrapper around read lines and stuff. I'll read a file using UTFA and on Windows convert the native encoding if possible. Can I just Wow, this what file is this? What is this? There's a lot of, these are oh this must be their utils. Yep, their utils file. <laughs> should I just rip this off or should I make it different? Or does I don't think FS has a function that does this, but I feel like uh maybe it's worth a look. Oh. I always feel kind of guilty just shamelessly uh, copying from that, but I want to maybe see if FS does something like this. I doubt it. Just curiosity. Yeah, I don't think they have a file read here. No. Yeah, maybe we... If we, if we acknowledge the source, maybe that is a good way to do it. Unicorn Coder, I like your suggestion. I don't think I did anything like that already. I'm just going to double check here. I have a template stuff. That's just a bunch of utilities. Okay, let's, let's, let's do that. We're going to acknowledge this came from Shiny directly. Contents, Reddit, get the link here and proper. I don't know why GitHub sometimes when you search for things, it gives you like the, um, the whole commit hash around this. I just want the utils file, so we'll just link to it directly here. That's not what I wanted. Okay, we'll just copy here. We'll clean it up afterwards. All right, so. The read. TF8. Just gonna get that first. There are other ones that this references like check encoding. ENC2 UTFA try native encoding, so we're gonna have to grab those. Okay, here's this one. Yep, there's check encoding. It looks like this has a function for is Windows or not. Wow, okay. Got a lot going on here. Is Windows. Is that in here? Yep. Oh, <laughs> that's a straightforward one, isn't it? This uh, platform OS type. Yep, lots of code here. Okay. Let's see if I got everything. Okay, I've got check encoding, try native encoding, ENC to UTFA. We don't have that yet. Let's find that. Did I skip it or is this? Is this somewhere else? Where is that function at? Okay, we're gonna have to search the repo for it. Maybe they put it somewhere else. Let's see. Two, three, eight. Where does that come from? 
Huh. Is that a function from somewhere else, or is that in base R? Maybe that's in base R. Oh, it is. Okay, no wonder. All right. I learned something new. Read or set the cleared encoding. So, oh, okay. Well, all right. So we don't need that verbatim. I think we have everything. So we will save that. We'll just run it in this. And we'll use per for it. Yeah, that's a good idea. While we're writing this on our own here. Sorry for the linting nonsense. I gotta take care of that. Where is... Yep, ENC to UTF-8. I believe it's the same thing with this as well, but we'll put it one place at least, so. Now let's um, just do a map on this. Our files. And then the function will be read UTF-8. Wow! Ah! Well, that was a crazy scroll there. Yep. I think I could just do it like this. We'll see. Alright. Yep, that looks good. It's got all the lines here. So, good, you're good. Yep, even preserved the blank line. So, yep, that, that part's working. So, uh, what do we do here? If this is strictly just to get the code out, let me go back to um, the uh, showcase script here. So I skipped it. Should be tab. Oh, this is what they do. Okay, so they paste it. Read UTF-8. Collapse equal dash n. And then equal false. So I don't know why... Oh, it's making one vector out of it. No kidding. Okay. Yeah, we should do that. We should do that. We either do that here or we do it in the other function. Let's just do it here and get it over with. So. Nope, not that. Not that. Not that. On the tilde. Let's close this out. All right. Well, since I talked about the native pipe in, uh, <laughs> in our weekly, um, why not move, use it here? Uh, <laughs> and this will be, what is this again? Paste and collapse here. Yeah. Wait a minute. Oh, this should work. Let's see if I bungle this up. Oh. Yep, it did. Okay. So it's one character vector for each um, file. Well, I just figure I, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna spend an episode, half an episode on it, I might as well give it a shot. But yeah, it's ugly as heck when you print it here, but it's, it worked, so. Okay, so. Let's call that rest for now. 
So, now the key is, can we feed this into the app itself? Like the sub-apps, I mean. So, that means we go back here. We have module ders, module files. Now, the reason I do it, module is kind of a bad choice of words now, because these aren't really shiny modules, they're app files. I should probably change that eventually. But what this is doing is that each sub app has a has a script called page whatever dot r like this one here and this has like the meat of everything and this is the place where i might load additional packages like if we look at um like page four this is going to have a pretty mess oh i know i don't load them verbatim that might be something i need to work on is where to put the oh i know the library statements go on app.r so i have to tell the user about that but anyway um once in shiny brain you source the contents of these the rest of everything follows suit afterwards um but anyway where it's um we're going to grab the um contents of all of these And we can do it after here. Um, oh, content, maybe let's do it like that. Uh, map, HIDs. This is read app code. Have people that page id dot x this should give me the contents of all the files that are in each of these places so we'll do a browser here and see if we are right power call okay we're here run code content okay let's inspect it yep there's our first one here the home home.r you can see it printed nicely when I do this view page one we got page one dot r page two page two r utils perfect Page two, page two dot r. Yep, this is this is really good. Yes, good, good, good. So successful there. Now I've got to feed this into the app itself. So that's a good call. That's a good call, Unicorn Coder. What um, VS Code likes to do is in these um, the way you can view list or vectors. Of things um, or oh, okay, just destroyed it but it'll if it knows it's a list it's going to treat it like JSON when it renders it there's some widget that they use to um, let you kind of go through that it's kind of like the list viewer in our studio but just using kind of more of a JavaScript -y kind of widget for it so yep it definitely looks like JSON so now what do I do with this so here the nav links are going to be supplied to app page, which is my function. I think that is that my util script. Yep, it is. Okay, I probably need to break this into like its own file because I look at it so much. Nav links, custom theme, page ID, title, BG. So we should have another parameter called code underscore content or whatever I called it. Whatever I called it over here, code underscore content. 
I may change it later. Let's just move this over here so I can see these side by side. Go content. nonsense per pmap arg list oh yeah yeah okay <laughs> this was the other change i used pmap instead because i threw in this theme argument thing and now i'm referencing it by position which still kind of feels icky but you know it it, it works so so now I've shifted things a little bit. So nav links is still position two. Page ID is position one. Custom theme is now three. Title is five and BG is six. So I gotta change that. And then now both content dot dot four. Let's get rid of this thing, even though that didn't work. Let's just make sure I didn't break anything with this, and then we'll be in good shape, I think. Don't need the uh, browser here anymore. Okay, nothing broke. I'm not doing anything with it, but at least nothing broke. So that was the, that was the big thing. Now, what do we do with this? Now we just have it as a parameter. See, this is where I use bslib to create that navigation bar. Nav links are like the, um, yeah, nav links are the nav items as like a, a call to something. And then, oh, okay, never mind. Let's um, refresh my memory on this a little bit. Page nav bar, the, the three dots here are the contents of the document body. So what that means is that it's just kind of like the, um, Well, it's not going to really show me here, but in fact, let's um, let's just run it ourselves. We'll put our browser here. We'll run this again. Okay, so we're just going to expand out and have wings. Yeah, it's just, okay, so it's just literally the um, items, the links to like home, page one, page two, page three, et cetera, et cetera. And then when we, um, yeah, I just did tags of this, that's all. So it's, it's a navigation bar, but I use the feature of in, in BS Lib when you have a nav bar, you can do arbitrary HTML links, not necessarily links to things in Shiny itself. So this gets it to act like it's brochure instead of like a native 90 or Shiny nav bar page. So that's why I did it this way. So actually, This code content may end up not belonging here after all. It needs to be, well, hmm. Gotta figure out where to put it. I do, I want a little button in the navigation bar that says, show me the code. Um, 
Mm. But I want each sub app to only have its relevant code in it. The danger in this is I don't want the user to have to worry about. If I go back here. Hold on. I don't want the user to have the heart to like. Like, I want this to look as native to Shiny as possible, like uh, a typical server function, a typical UI function. There shouldn't have to be anything different about this, so I, I may have to rethink how I do this. It could be that this it has the entire code but then the user could toggle between them no matter what page of the app they're in. Maybe that's a better way to do it, where it doesn't matter which tab they're in, they'll see the same thing. Maybe that's it. So. Hmm. Probably going to need some more delicate thinking time about this. Um, but at least I got the contents itself. That was the one small achievement tonight. Unicorn Coder, you have a good uh, comment here. He's asking, won't that get confusing between two navbar styles? So, in the context of a shiny brain-powered app, the end user is actually not going to interact with this directly. I'm taking care of that for them. But what they will be able to customize is the title, the background color, and the theme. They'll be able to customize all that. Like the theme, they can customize it here with VS Live default stuff. But they will not necessarily need to worry about the details of what that what that um, navigation bar is being produced with. They just know that each sub app has an entry in it called like page one, page two, etc. But if it if we get more users on this and they have a little more confusion around it, then I'll definitely um, maybe make that a little easier to, to reason with. But it's one of those things where I'm trying to hide it from them, not to sound selfish, but trying to make it so that they only concentrate on these things here, like this page one, and whatever supporting scripts they need to do that. The app.r, other than the packages at the top, they shouldn't have to change this or the app title or the BG. So like everything over here they can change, but everything down here, which I'll have to make more clear, I don't want them touching at all. Like that is static, if you will. So that's where things are landing now. So I do need to think a little bit about how to smooth out where this code is going. It's kind of like a magical UI element that I want thrown in automatically. That's kind of why I was thinking if I could somehow put it in here. Now there is a feature in BS Lib page nav arm that I'm not using yet. I'll, I'll show you what that is. It has, like right now we're putting the, we're kind of putting those um, navigation links in the, you might call the, the, the body of that, I believe. Actually, let me double check here. Yeah, we're just executing those UI functions. It's considering that the body of it, um, right here. They wanted me to put it as a header, but when I did it as a header, it kind of messed things up a bit. So, um, the key for me is there's another place I could put it, and that's the footer. I could throw it in the footer below the nav content. It's not ideal, but I'm just curious if it works. Um, just throw it in there somewhere. So, 
so over here. I may just try. Footer. Um, I know I can put like arbitrary content in it. Um, Let me find an example of that. Oh, let's just do a silly thing here. Let's do it. Let's just see if this does anything. We don't need this anymore. There. I do not see a footer here, do I? Uh, something messed up here. Oh, I didn't do dev tools load all that. I. Yep, that's always some. That's a gotcha in package development. If you're not careful, if you don't load your changes afterwards, it won't. It won't know you did anything. That's an easy thing to miss. Um, so let's see. Oh, there it is. Okay, so you see here, it just showed up here. That's obviously not ideal. So we'll, yeah, it just, whatever that content is. Like, I want it up here instead. So we're going to have to fix that a little bit. Oops, not that one. Um, well, Unicorn Coder, yeah, Shiny JS. Shiny JS is a great package from, uh, one of my better friends, uh, Dina Telly, and actually in my conversation with Joe Chang earlier this morning, when I was showing my my really really massive big app, um, I had actually used another one of Dean's uh, packages, Shiny Screenshot. This is a fun one. It lets you take a screenshot of your entire page or part of your Shiny app within the app itself. It's wrapping, um, oh, what's the widget it's wrapping? I forgot, but uh, Joe actually Googled it while I was, while I was showing him my big app and he, he learned something new. So it was kind of fun to show that off. But, but yeah, uh, I'll put a link to this in the, in the chat here. I really like this um, package. I haven't used it to its fullest potential yet. Oh, HTML the Canvas, that's the JavaScript library. But, uh, yeah, that's a fun. And guess who's a sponsor? Yeah, haha, <laughs> me. Um, I love this so much. I was like, you know, Dean, please keep developing this. I'm using it. So there you go. Take my small money. <laughs> so that was a that's a fun fun way to contribute back to open source when you get those opportunities. So anyway, I don't want the footer there. That's that's no good. Now, I believe there's a way in the nav links. This is kind of interesting. Okay, the nav links are a tag. Yeah, okay, I've styled the tag already because that is... Oh, I closed the file, didn't I? Let's just get rid of some of this. Let me get the file back. Yeah, what I'm... HIDs. Yeah, via sort nav item. That's what I was... Okay, that's what I need. Okay, so... Finally refreshing my memory here. And by the way, um, for the workshop, you better believe when we talk about BS Lib, I love it. I'm definitely gonna put it into the workshop. I think it deserves a lot more attention. So nav item. Great nav items for use inside nav containers. So 
nav item. This is what I was kind of trying to say earlier, but I didn't add my words out well. It's arbitrary content in the navigation panel, links to external content. So for brochure, it thinks those things like page one, page two are just links to some random site. It's actually linking the app that's embedded in. Um, so I want probably another nav item, but with the, should be in, nav content UI elements for nav menu. Oh, tags the place directly in it. So, hmm. But you know what, when they view the code, I don't want it to suppress the app itself. Because if I do it in just a straight nav element, it's going to like take the whole window of it. I want it to kind of like expand out, kind of like a collapsible right sidebar almost. I'm definitely over engineering this, I can tell, but trying to think my way through it. I may have to play with this a little bit later. I feel like I could go in a lot of rabbit holes with this, but this is the area that I want to hone in on. It is probably some form of nav item, but it's going to do something when you click it. Maybe like a JavaScript function or something. Okay. Well, I kind of know where to go. Let's um, clean up stuff here and then we'll maybe call it there. But let's see, what, what did I do here? I, oh yeah, made a new function. Function to be what did I do here? I'll add the argument code content to app page. Don't do anything with it yet, but I added it. All right. Save it? Oh, oh, no wonder. Okay. There we go. Let's unstage it, restage it. Okay. And then. Okay, it's all local, let's publish this. Publish just means sh send it to GitHub, that way when I work on my laptop with this probably tomorrow, I'll pull it back down there while I'm on location, as they say. <laughs> I'm definitely the only person at my son's swimming class that's hacking on Shiny and R. <laughs> while they're swimming. Uh, if I ever saw another R user one of those things, I would I would I would geek out, but I'm not yet, so Alright. I think that's a pretty good successful um for tonight. Um, you know, we always like build incrementally on this, but I'm I'm pretty happy with it. So got it committed. Well, the, whenever, um, so Daniel, whenever, um, I know, um, Anne, I believe, was streaming earlier today. Um, I was watching her stream from a parking lot, of course, so I always like find ways of geeking out when I'm waiting for these things. Um, but yeah, that, that, those lessons go quick when you're like knee deep in something, you're like, oh, oh, geez, he's coming out of the pool now. I gotta, gotta shut down here. Um, so I, 
bit by bit. Sometimes the commits look completely random. That's because I have to quickly get some on GitHub and then get out. So it's always, it's always a mad dash for it. Um, good, good. I think that will um, quit out BS code here. Close this up. Perfect. Docker should be happy now. Um, just make sure all my uh, changes made it. Should have a new branch here. Yep, showcase. Perfect. Yep. There's two, three commits ahead of main. Perfect. Yep, so that's in. That is in. Okay. So actually my story time was uh, talking a bit about my uh, workshop advice. So I definitely covered some good things there, but um, yeah, what was the idea I wanted to mention there? There was something else, but it's escaped me now. Oh, okay. Well, Daniel, you're here. I I'm going to put you on the spot for something. I've got to start making slides for the workshop because of course I need to talk about material. Now, I have heard that Quarto does have like a more spruced up version of Reveal.js as an option. Would you recommend I use that or should I still stick with uh, Sharingan for my slides? What's your, what's your take on that? I'd be curious because I have done Sharingan up to this point for the past about a year and a half for some of my uh, presentations. In fact, let's just have fun looking at one of my recent ones here. It was, uh, yeah, the data, the data mishaps one. This was Sharingan. Styled up, of course, but I had lots of fun making that one. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, you, you would use Quarto because it is new and you get to tinker with it. Yeah, there is that kind of newness to be. Um, that, oh, yeah. And the, and the top line support. <laughs> because you better believe that our, our friends at our studio are going to want to work out any usability issues before they really put this in the mainstream of the community at our studio comp. So I may I may do a, a, just an experiment with it, maybe on stream, maybe not, um, just to get a feel for it. I... It's kind of funny. I, I feel like I wanted to talk to Garrick about this, but I ran out of time. Um, Share again is like that thing where I want to use it because it's so, it's got this like, I don't know what the hell to say, but it's like this kind of geek cred to it of like all the fancy things you can do with it. But it's also those fancy things that I take a long time to build. Like I don't have Garrick's like web development wizardry in my head. Um, and the other thing is when you look at the source code of a Sharingan deck, in fact, let's look at mine here on this, uh, presentation here. Let's just boot it up here. It, I don't know the best way to say it, but when we get to like, it's, it's got like that raw HTML kind of look to it with the CSS look to it. Um, like, I get why it is, but when you kind of look at this at a high level, unless you've been in Sharingan for a while, you get kind of lost a little bit. And even I still get lost sometimes when I read it. So I'm kind of curious if I go with Quarto's uh, route, if it looks, if it's easier to kind of look at it at a high level and really understand what each slide is doing. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too facetious about this, but I feel like when I look at a Sharingan deck that I have to really sit down with it for a while to really understand like what that part of the code was doing. Like I'll have the slides on another monitor and I'll kind of search and replay or search for keywords and then boot it up in the code and try to figure out, okay, that tag did that or that, that uh, declaration did what? 
and I have not mastered it. Like every time I build these slides, it probably takes me twice as long as it would be if it was just a straight R Markdown flavored slide deck. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give Quarto a play. I, I've been wanting to play with it for a while. And you know, as, as Unicorn Coder said, we've been seeing a lot of press in this in the community, especially on Twitter um, the past couple of days. Um, and for a workshop, like my my purpose is different. This isn't like a conference presentation where you um, the, the 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 feel of it's different. This is this is meant to be a great resource that will stand alone. That I want people to refer to for learning something, not so much just for amusement, but for actually learning stuff. So maybe I'll give a quarto a play here. Even if it just makes it easier for me to just concentrate on the content and not get lost in the weeds of like styling so much or doing the weird web tricks so much. Sometimes I get down under those rabbit holes way too much. Um, maybe I'm not alone in that, but it does remind me of the old, uh, well, some of that Daniel, you probably have some not so fond memories about is getting into the internals of LaTeX as you're trying to um, polish something up for, for that publication slides uh, or publication like document. Um, it, um, when I did my dissertation, I went in the weeds way too much with my LaTeX template um, towards the end there. And I, that's time I'll never get back. So maybe I have to put the brakes a little bit and just kind of let the content speak for itself and have have something that I can go with for each module, like Unicorn, you're saying, make a template. Yeah, have a portal template and just reuse that in certain places. So, you know what? Yep, I'm gonna give Quarto a play. So, that will be fun. Um, that'll, that'll be fun. Yep, I'm looking forward to giving that a shot. So, good, good. Well, been at it for a little over, yeah, and and well, y you all should know how I roll by now, but yeah, you better believe I'll stream it. <laughs> I will definitely stream my experience of it, and, and Daniel, as you said, we got some nice, uh, at least at the moment, first tier support, just kind of waiting for hopefully to fix uh, some bugs that come their way, so I will take advantage of it while the iron is hot, as they say. Um, okay. I think that will probably do it for me. I'll make a quick plug. Uh, some of you already are aware of this, but um, our weekly is back. Um, we just uh, released our week 13 issue. I'm very happy for it. That even though it's, we've got a long ways to go, folks. This is still not the same from us on the inside as what it used to be, but we're gonna keep it going. It'll be more manual. But the other thing that I want to, whether it's on this stream or not, or just in my spare time somehow, is now that we're like starting from scratch in terms of like what we do to curate things, there's a lot of tooling out there that I think if we can morph it into something that is easily um, administered by people of, you know, decent knowledge of R and maybe some knowledge of web development or automation stuff, but not necessarily requiring a huge mastery of it, that we can maintain this like more democratically. For better or worse, and this is Eric's unfiltered opinion, I don't speak for the whole R Weekly team on this, the fact that we depended on we we've depended on um, our founder of it so much for all the infrastructure and not just like the idea of it. I actually feel guilty of not trying to understand it better when I first came on the team. I fell into my curator role, which I still am, obviously, and now as a you maybe might say a talking head about it but I didn't do enough in the early days to really understand how all the bits worked. Um, and now we're kind of paying for it. At least, I mean, I'm not saying it's all my fault. I'm just saying that 
I would have been better prepared for something that happened that happened last year if I had learned more about how the engine was powering all of this. I learned a bit over the break, but then I got lost because there were some parts of this back end that we can't even access. And that's, again, just a fact. It's not a right or wrong, it's just a fact. But if I know the high, high level purpose of that, you know, that aspect of the back end, we might be able to cook up something that has hooks to different systems that are more in the general domain now, like GitHub Actions or, you know, things like that. And we've got some talented people on our, our weekly team that have great knowledge of the whole tech stack of things. Not so much how our weekly did it, but just in general of these principles. Um, cough, cough, Colin Fay, I'm looking at you. Um, he has a lot more knowledge of, of these as well. So maybe it just takes me like sitting down with Colin for a bit and we just kind of look at all this and see what we can do to build a, a version that we all can contribute to somehow. So, so in the meantime, it's still going to keep going. It's just going to be a little more work for us, but we, we want to keep it going. And there were definitely, I, it may have seemed like it was all silence, but we were all reading the people saying they missed our weekly. I saw even some Reddit posts saying they missed it. Um, some Twitter posts and you know, I, I would see it out there and I, I felt bad because we didn't have a lot we could do, but now we're, we're, we're back in it. So excited for it. It feels, it feels good because now my Tuesday afternoons are, are fun because that's when I sit down with Mike and we record our episode and before we've been off for like three months. So it always felt kind of odd, but yeah, that's a good issue. So check that out. And yes, of course, as I said, the podcast is up and <laughs> uh, yeah you want you <laughs> the live stream of recording huh yeah i uh <laughs> yeah that would be something that would be something um need to have some think time about that um especially after the epic failure that happened this past time <laughs> when i didn't hit the record button now of course, Daniel, you know who does that, right? I mean, Jupiter Broadcasting does that routinely for their podcast. They'll do a live stream version of it. They'll have all their flubs and all their mishaps and mispronunciations and and stuff, and it's highly interactive. So I, I like that idea. It's just, um, it's, it's a different mindset, and... I have to make sure Mike is also comfortable with that. It's not just me anymore. So that's um, another thing. And yeah, uh, you know, it's uh, duly noted uh, in the old noggin here. So I will, um, whether it's our week or something else, we'll, we'll make that happen. You know, if it's just the main podcast itself or it's more of a discussion thing, but we'll see, we'll see. But, but yeah, it's good to have it. Moved back here, and why is it? This should have been updated. I'm a little scared now. There it is. Okay. Phew. Scare me for a second. I just had to refresh the page, but yep, there's our show notes for it. Um, the other thing, yeah, impromptu stuff. It's um, you know, that's that's part of it. But one thing I do have my eye on is a way for obtaining you might say better value so to speak like direct value um there's a long story around this and i'm still kind of wrapping my head around it but there's a new movement in the podcasting space where it's trying to cut out kind of the middle middle part of like funding or contributions where Almost oh, many of the podcasts I listen to have like a Patreon account or a PayPal account or something like that. There's somebody that's helping take that money, probably taking some fees from it and then passing it on to that that person or that company that's hosting it or host that's providing the service that they want funding for. There's a way now with some new technology to get more direct contributions and when I mean direct, I mean literally in an instant. 
um, through, I'll say it, blockchain technology. Um, and that is basically what you're just saying, Daniel. And it, it will amount to direct transfers, but using, using blockchain instead. Um, I have, I've been learning about this because um, Chris from Jupiter Broadcasting is kind of re, he's become a pioneer of adopting this along with some others to get more direct feedback from the audience. Because honestly, the podcasting space for the smaller scale ones, like people like me who don't do this for a day job, or even the ones that do do it for their daily work, but they're not affiliated with like Spotify, YouTube, um, name the other podcasting like platforms out there. We're in a little trouble. Independent media is in a little trouble. So we got to figure out ways of reaching the audience, but letting the audience dictate the direction without something kind of gobbling it up or something that is compromising our values as podcast hosts with like advertising we don't agree with or terms of service we don't agree with, but keeping the spirit of podcasting where it's truly independent media that's tailored to the audience that they're reaching. In all my 10 years or so of doing this, I have never once taken a sponsor. I had offers, but they were from people I never agreed with. And, and, and I feel okay with that, but also at the same time, that it's still totally out of my spare time and my my expense too like everything that's around me <laughs> nobody paid for it but me um so and it translates also i think to a new funding model for open source as well not just me as a blabber of in a microphone um so i feel like we're on the cusp of something but i gotta wrap my head around it but i may try it out try out some ideas with our weekly highlights with maybe the shiny dev series as ways of having more transparent and more direct value for value propositions so again these are all high level things um let's see but i see some good comments here um then you're wondering is it curious if there's a way to get our consortium money you know It's interesting you say that. Um, part of it is I sometimes have a hard time thinking that this this kind of medium is worth it to people like them. Like, how meaningful is this to the broader art community? Now, some people are very nice. They say, oh, what you do, Eric, is very meaningful, and I always appreciate that. But would they pay attention to something like that? I don't know. Now, of course, we've seen the immense efforts that they've done to help our ladies go to the next level with funding for that. Um, some other community initiatives. So, I mean, there is precedence for community driven things. But would they go for just some, you know, near middle age uh, R user <laughs> of how many years uh, talking about this? Um, I don't know. Maybe. I'll give it some thought, but I'd have to, I'd have to really justify that somehow in my mind first. Um, but it was always my way of kind of like taking what I learned from the Linux world and how podcasting got me totally listening to their podcast. We like Chris Fisher, Larry Bushy, um, Chess Griffin before that. Um, they're the ones that made me fall in love with Linux and be able to learn it and use it for not just my work and my schoolwork and in grad school, but to actually use it for fun and really literally become a part of my job. Like the Linux skills I learned from them, I use every day in my job when I do the HPC stuff. So it's like that had a transformative effect on me. 
I don't know if what I do has any similar effect to other people. Um, there was one person I met at work recently who's, we've never met face to face yet because I only learned about him for the pandemic, but we had a face to face meeting um, about a week ago. And he's a very nice guy, like he, he's very knowledgeable. He, and he, he was, um, it's the first time I've experienced this. He was a little nervous and I'm like, hey, yeah, how are you doing, how are you doing? He's like, I feel like I'm, I, I feel so like, I don't want to say, put words, I'm paraphrasing here, but he was like, I'm having one of those like starstruck moments. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm true. No, I'm just a normal guy. Just like talking about art. That's all I am. But there, it's always gratifying to hear that. But do I do that enough? And I'm not like doing this to grab points here, but I, I want what I do to be meaningful, but maybe it's meaningful in different ways. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I, um, I'll give this some thought. You, you all always give me good ideas to think about. and it, it is a passion of mine. It's just not enough time in the world, so to speak. Um, I'm certainly envious of the people that can do this full time. I'm very envious of it, but who knows? Anyway, I blab too much about that, but, uh, <laughs> but it looks like there. Okay. So there is a Twitter thread that Daniel, you've linked to here. Um, let me pull that up on the stream here. Let's see here. Comparing all my oh okay okay I need the I need to bookmark this okay I will like it right now and so I can refer back to that. That's good stuff. It's pretty rad. Okay I okay I'm gonna. I am gonna parse this. Okay, so I definitely see the pipe. The having Python side by side is is a nice feature. Okay. Oh, this is okay. I gotta. What are those apps that like unroll a thread or something? I need to figure out what those are. But I'm gonna read this after afterwards or probably tomorrow too. So, thank you, Daniel, for linking this. This looks this looks very fun to digest. So, okay. Well. Talk about an epic end to this. I, I went on a huge rant about podcasting and funding, and you all were very, very kind to listen to that. So, um, okay. So, again, thank you all for the great ideas. Um, small improvements to Shiny Brain. Uh, and like I said, the, the, the work for the workshop is going to commence very soon. And, um, yeah, I'll be having fun exploring Porto on stream uh, with all of you probably next next week's a little different because my kids are on spring breaks so I don't know if I'll be on here for real but at some point you'll see me uh, you see me do a quarto fun there so okay well let's, let's close up shop here find all the previous interviews at shinydevseries.com check out rweekly.org for the our weekly issue and the podcast there and send me a shout on Twitter um, if you want to get in touch with, with stuff. So y'all have an awesome night. I will see you hopefully very soon. Just not sure when, but have fun. And um, yeah, take care. End of line, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>